Netflix concept as a way of capturing the lived process of devastation and abandonment, rather than thinking about the physical ruins of sites to be remembered. And I think the, the concept of ruination is really powerful because it implies a sense of violence or injustice through destruction, abandonment and dislocation of people, of communities and ways of life. And in the context of deindustrialization, industrial ruination ranges from job losses to toxic exposures to the stigma associated with decline. Uh, but as I've uh, looked through further research, it also evokes contradictory effects of loss and mourning for the past, but also shame and regret over the toxic harm of polluting industries and over complicated and implicated actually histories of settler colonialism and imperialism. So this is an area where I've turned my attention to more over the years, and it's where I will be focusing my future research uh, within this deindustrialization project. The anthropologist Anne Laura Stoller has, has written about ruination as a way of thinking through the devastating and complex impacts of imperial formations on social life. And for her, the concept of ruination is also powerful because of its implications, both as a noun, suggesting a kind of material state of decay, but also as a verb, suggesting an active process that is violent and corrosive. And Stoller writes, uh, imperial projects are themselves processes of an ongoing ruination, processes that bring ruin upon, exerting material and social force in the present. By defining ruination, it's an ambiguous term, both an act of ruining, a condition of being ruined, and a cause of it. It's an act perpetrated or perpetuated, a condition which is subject and a cause, cause of loss. So my recent work has, has shifted to look at ruination at, at, at different sites and scales. I think it's interesting and important to look at the planetary scale of climate catastrophe and toxic injustice. And uh, my recent work has focused particularly on what's known as the fence line of petrochemical polluted communities, which still have living industry, but actually have many of the features of deindustrialization. So recently, my colleague Lorenzo Felton and I have been writing about a phenomenon that we call noxious deindustrialization in a study of the petrochemical town of Grangemouth in Scotland, which was once known as the boom town of British petroleum, where there have been massive job losses since the 1970s due to employment deindustrialization, but there's continually toxic harmful effects of pollution as industry itself has remained and in fact flourished but contracted jobs. So before opening out to speakers, I want to raise two points about the ethics of researching ruination, because these have continued to trouble me in my work and, and in my reflections. I've written a little bit about this, but I will be more in the future. And the first relates to the scholar activist Eve Tuck, and who's written a call for communities, researchers and educators to reconsider the long-term impact of, of damage-centered research in indigenous communities and other disenfranchised communities where pain and loss are documented in order to hold those in power responsible for damages, including in cases of environmental injustice in deindustrialized communities. So Tuck writes, it is a powerful idea to think of us all as litigators putting the world on trial, but is, does it actually work? Do the material and political wins come through? And most importantly, are the wins worth the long-term costs of thinking of ourselves as damaged? I think that's a really important thing to think about, about you know, places wh which have experienced a lot of suffering and what it means for a researcher to think about that sensitively uh, and without sort of, I guess, reducing agency or voice of people. Uh, the second point, uh, is, was raised in a very different way by the sociologist Richard Sennett, who wrote that classic work on the hidden injuries of class with uh, uh, Jonathan Cobb in the 70s uh, uh, research, where he recently made uh, this essay about um, what happens if, if uh, Trump wins election and reflecting about whether the US could heal after that. It's available in the Guardian. So Senate writes, in the 1970s, I thought that the hidden injuries of class might heal in part through local face-to-face -face interaction with people who are different. 
That hope doesn't make sense today. I've lost my empathy for the complex motivations that animate fear and reaction. The mantra of bringing the country together loses any meaning as the base hardens and shifts to the extreme right. Instead, it has to be held to account for the criminal tendencies encouraged by its leader. The US isn't going to heal anytime soon. So I think in really different ways, these two different scholars, Eve Tuck and Richard Sennett, are actually quite critical of the practice of researching ruination, particularly in terms of the limitations of research for actually healing the damages, the injustices, the social inequalities. Yet I think it's important, and I think more now than ever, amidst escalating social, ecological, and political crises from rising populism and authoritarianism to deepening social and economic and ecological inequalities, to increasing precariousness and employment, to the global health crisis that we're all facing and the unfolding climate catastrophe, to address uh, uncomfortable issues of ruination, of processes involving destruction, but also societal transformation, because the stakes are over effectively the collective values and the future of our planet. So that's my opening. <laughs> thoughts on the concept of reunion. And now I'm going to open up um, to the floor. So the order of presenters, um, unfortunately, um, Roberta Garuccio has, has, is no longer on the program and will be, um, Stephen High is kindly taking um, her place. So uh, we'll begin with Arthur uh, MacGyver, followed by uh, Stephen High, who can will re replace her slot. Then Fred Brerel, um, Rebecca Dolge, Olaf Schmidt-Rut, and, and that, that will open out to a uh, conclusion. So for presenters, um, I will uh, flash a one minute uh, when you've got one minute left. I think it's, is it seven or eight minutes? It's se seven minutes, I think, uh, eight, eight minutes. So I'll, I'll flash it at, at seven. So uh, yeah, over, over to you, Arthur MacGyver, Professor of History at the University of Strathclyde. Uh, sorry, Alice, can I, uh, can I share screen, please? Uh, okay. I think you can do that your, yourself, yeah. Yeah, you okay. should be able to do that, Arthur. Cool. Thank you. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Fantastic. Um, well, thank you very much, Alice, um, and, uh, and thank you, Steve, for, for inviting me to talk at this, uh, this workshop. Uh, my research focus, um, as many of you know, is, is Scotland, um, that uh, very little country at the top of the UK that uh, voted against Brexit, uh, and apparently with no spoilt votes at all, no spoilt ballot ballots at all. Um, <coughs> Uh, Scotland, uh, yeah, so yeah, my research focus on Scotland, but um, particularly on uh, this area highlighted here in blue in the map, uh, the industrial heartland um, of the country, the, the area centering around the port city of Glasgow um, and, its, uh, and its hinterland, the, the, the area that was really the epicenter of Scotland's uh, industrialization process. Uh, Scotland's also a, a place uh, with a thriving and rich base of scholarship on deindustrialization studies, with a really exciting work being undertaken across coal mining communities, textile communities, uh, metalworking communities, and the like, uh, as indicated in this list of my colleagues uh, and other researchers' work. And uh, I wanted to register my, uh, my debt at the very outset to, um, uh, to this work. Uh, and also to Stephen High's um, uh, inspirational work on deindustrialization. And with my apologies to any of those in Scotland that I've missed out on my, um, <coughs> on my wee list. Okay, perhaps I could uh, start my um, observations on deindustrialization and ruination with a, with a comment on the, the epidemiology, um, which is extensive and pretty unequivocal, I think, in identifying Glasgow and West Central Scotland as an area devastated by deindustrialization, which occurred at an accelerated pace and intensity from the 1970s uh, on at an almost unrivaled pace across Europe, and which produced a health crisis evident in mortality rates and lower life expectancy, uh, especially for men. Losing work in this area invariably meant deprivation, deterioration, and degradation of health evident across multiple health indices, 
including physical and mental health, from heart failure rates, respiratory disease, um, through to depression, and to higher suicide rates. Clearly, I think we're, we're, uh, this area in uh, uh, West Central Scotland epitomizes uh, deindustrialization induced uh, ruination. Um, amongst their studies, uh, 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 this series of papers called The Aftershock of Deindustrialization, um, where the Glasgow Centre for Population Health identified West Central Scotland, Clydeside region, as amongst uh, the worst in Europe, um, comparing it with other deindustrializing uh, places. And I think this work resonates with um, research on the post socialist deindustrialization mortality crisis. Um, work of people like David Kadekel uh, and uh, Gabor uh, Shearing on. On, on, on Romania and Hungary, uh, respectively. Um, my, I suppose, primary focus uh, as an oral historian uh, has been to try and reconstruct uh, lived experience through the voices and memories of those directly affected. To get beyond the, um, the, the data, the statistics, and explore how ruin, uh, ruination was felt experienced and narrated by those uh, in the working class communities affected. Uh, fortunately, Scotland has a, a really rich uh, vein of archived oral histories. We've got quite a lot in our Scottish Oral History Centre. Um, but I'd, uh, I'd like to give a shout out to um, the wonderful veteran oral historian in Scotland, the Studs Turkel of Scotland, Ian McDougall. Who, um, who interviewed widely in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. Unfortunately, Ian tragically died of COVID um, earlier in the pandemic. Um, the, the, these interviews, um, these, um, these narratives um, feature bodies uh, heavily in, in their storytelling, uh, in that sense, they uh, very similar to the sorts of um, stories that were told to Portelli in his, um, his book, they say, in Highland County. Uh, but I think what emerges from um, the Scottish narratives are um, a range of experiences and a variety of ways of telling. There were what I've called um, or referred to as liberation or escape narratives of those who welcome change uh, and who adapted frequent motifs uh, here emphasize the dangers, the unhealthy work environments, and control aspects of Fordist um, work in mines, steelworks, and other heavy industrial work. We were being told, I think, that uh, folk were glad that they, in particular their kids, um, escaped this fate. The majority, though, uh, are probably best described as trauma narratives, a phrase used uh, by Alice Ma in uh, industrial ruination and community in place. These stories flesh out the identity mutations, uh, the emasculation, the downward spiral associated with unemployment. Stigmati stigmatization and shame feature heavily uh, in these narratives and at their extreme dis despair and desperation. Narratives also told of um, multiple vulnerabilities, lack of resources and diminished capacities uh, of uh, pathways to, to, to ill health. Health issues originated in many uh, or for many in work itself um, with accumulated risks, dangers, hazards, industrial diseases uh, and the like which undermined their health and well-being. And stresses and pressures in work I think intensified in the long run, in that uh, sorry, long rundown for those survivor workers, as they and their unions became disempowered and vulnerable to what's been termed the neoliberal attack. Workers carried these scars and disabilities uh, through to their experience beyond uh, the industrial workplace. Uh, and these narrators, I think, also told of, of strategies, strategies of action, of mobilization, resistance, community and trade union mitigations. This certainly included strikes uh, and occupations, but also fleeting references to a grassroots environmental health and justice movement. 
in Glasgow uh, and elsewhere. I'm thinking here of, uh, uh, of Lack and Mac McKinnon's wonderful work on Cape Breton, Nova Scotia and closing Cisco. Um, in Glasgow and elsewhere, uh, it's clearly a double burden of living with pollution and with the adverse health impacts of, uh, of losing work. For Glasgow and West Scotland, this ruination constituted an unprecedented health crisis uh, and one which is, um, which is currently being exacerbated by uh, COVID-19. My time's up, uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, looking forward to questions and discussion, thank you. Thanks very much, Arthur, that was a, a great talk. We look forward to the discussions. So next we have uh, Professor Stephen High, Professor of History at, at uh, the University of Concordia, who you all know. <laughs> Welcome, Stephen. Stephen, you'll need to unmute. Yeah, yeah I just noticed that. <laughs> okay. Um, so my, my presentation begins with Anne uh, Laura Stoller and ends with Eve Tuck. And so uh, Alice and I are, are definitely on, on the same wavelength. And, and actually, I, I, I'm getting into some of the same issues that, um, that Arthur was talking about in terms of you know, the ruination and how that um, ripples outward into you know, people's lives and through communities and so on. So I think I think again, like we're, you know, the issues that have been raised so far are, are really resonant to, to what the work I'm doing here, here in Montreal. Uh, industrial ruins are made, not found, and are the product of a profoundly political process. As historian Anne Laura Stoller argues in her book, Imperial Debris, ruination is an act perpetrated, a condition to which one is subject, and a cause of loss. But ruination is more than a process. It is also a political project that lays waste to certain people and places, relations, and things. Ruination and decline are also integral processes within global capitalism, as Alice Ma recently wrote. Ruination is not only material, it is social, it is a lived process. You're not seeing my, oh, there we go, okay. I'd like to focus my, my comments today on the ways that industrial ruination leaves working class uh, people behind. Disinvestment is not a one-step process, it has cumulative effects. In recent years, the left behind has become popular shorthand to describe those physically and economically left behind in deindustrialized areas. Some people were forcibly displaced, while others were forcibly immobilized. In deindustrialization studies, we speak a great deal about mine, mill, and factory closures. We spend considerably less time on what comes after, as working class towns and neighborhoods depopulate and lose their stores, taverns, churches, pool halls, chip shops, restaurants, community centers and schools. One interviewee, Debbie Fox, especially mourned the loss of the bingo halls, an important social space for working class women. These are all links in the industrial ruination chain. For the rest of my presentation, I'll focus my comments on the former industrial neighborhood of Point St. Charles in Montreal. It's the neighborhood I actually live in, which lost half of its population between 1961 and 1991 a rate comparable to the hardest hit cities in the US Rust Belt. The extent to which people were left behind is documented by any number of bitter statistics. We heard a number of them in the context of Glasgow. By 1981, here in Point St. Charles, more than half of residents were living in poverty. Knowledge that their home neighborhood has emptied out 
during their lifetime infuses oral history interviews with longtime residents. One person after another contrasted past fullness to present day emptiness. According to Jean-Jacques Beauchamp, it was crowded in Point St. Charles. It's not like today. Back then you had twice as many people as today, if not more. There were lots of factories, lots of plants. There's still Owens, Illinois. Apart from that, there's nothing. For her part, Donna Carey told us that there is no work here. So everything is closed and moved away. Residents once had everything in Point St. Charles. We had barber shops and butcher shops. There was a lot of big places back in the day, lots of bars. There was a bar in every corner. The place was booming in the 70s, but then somehow I guess people moved away. Like many of those interviewed, Donna Carey was resigned to these changes. Quote, there is nothing you can really do about it. So you just move on, things change. According to the community health clinic in the neighborhood, industrialism had tied workers to place. After all, these were neighborhood factories with a multi-generational connection to many families. According to the clinic, the weak mobility of residents prevented many displaced workers from effectively adjusting to, to the departure of capital. It reported that, quote, we can explain historically the immobilization and marginalization of the residents of the point by the evolution of the needs of the, the local and global economic system. And this was written in the early 1980s. More than a century of industrial production and its loss has left its traces in people's bodies much as, as um, uh, the work of others, uh, Arthur and others have, have pointed out. Uh, Point St. Charles ranks the worst in, its, in a long list of health categories in Montreal, including heart disease, premature births, infant mortality, cancer, low income, and single parent households. As the neighborhood hollowed out and people left, major fires proliferated. House fires have long, long signaled urban crisis. This was something I understood as a teenager watching Detroit cable TV from Thunder Bay. Other parts of Canada, however, got their cable TV from Buffalo, New York. So it was the industrial suburb of Lackawanna that always seemed to be on fire. It became the punchline of a bad joke. In many ways, Point St. Charles was Quebec's equivalent to Lackawanna. To give you an idea of how bad things got, let's take a look at Bourgeois, a small residential street just three blocks long. It experienced five major fires in just three years during the mid 1980s, displacing 24 households. These are all row houses. Several of these fires were caused by arson. One was sparked by a Molotov cocktail thrown through a window. In April 1987, a deadly fire killed a family of three. The Orr family has, had fallen on hard times and had their heat shut off in the middle of winter due to unpaid bills. They turned to electric mobile heaters for warmth, one of which sparked the fire. If plant closures are spectacles of suffering and victimhood, as Jackie Clark suggests, the slow violence that followed proved to be no less painful. Deindustrializing towns and neighborhoods underwent a process of pauperisation in French uh, or group destitution or impoverishment. It's a term used more frequently in the French language scholarship than in the English, but it captures the immobilizing effects of industrial ruination. That said, there's a growing realization of the political and conceptual limits of loss effects-based research can only take us so far. Indigenous scholar Eve Tuck, among others, has asked us to reconsider the dominant damage-centered approach to research with its focus on pain and loss as it pathologizes marginalized communities. This cautionary message deserves to be heard as we consider the meaning and interpretive value of industrial ruination. Exactly the point I think that, that Alice was making earlier. So thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Stephen. It's, it's, it's 
great to see that we have <laughs> similar <laughs> thoughts and we can talk more about that. Uh, so uh, next presenter uh, is Fred Burrell, a PhD candidate in the Department of History at the University of Concordia. Thanks, Alice. Um, Lauren, the, the, the slide that I sent you last night, could, could you throw that up? Great. Yeah. Thanks. Just one second. Um, so uh, unlike uh, Stephen and Arthur, I don't I, I don't operate very well visually <laughs> or uh, sort of schematically. Uh, so I, I don't have a fancy PowerPoint. I just I just have a map you can look at. Uh, and unlike uh, you know the rest of the folks on, on on the panel, I'm kind of in the midst of the scramble to finish my dissertation at the moment. Uh, so I've got two million and one uh, very detailed thoughts on the concept of uh ruinization which i won't bore you with because they're not yet in any sort of coherent order so i'm going to try to just zoom out a little bit and and think uh, just in a very sort of programmatic way about the concept of of ruinization so my work that i'm uh, that i'm hammering away at now is is looking at working class political responses to deindustrialization uh, and gentrification in the in the montreal neighborhood of saint Henri. Uh, which, as you can see from the map that you have there, a map um, of the Southwest that, that you'll know from Stephen's work, um, and where I've sort of childishly circled it in red, uh, that's that's the San uh, district. Or maybe you can't, maybe that, yeah, you can see my little sort of childish scroll. Um, so this area of the Southwest of the city certainly qualifies as having undergone ruination. Um, from 1950 to 1970, uh, I think it was around 85 different factories closed in Saint Henri, uh, and from the broader southwest uh, district of the city, 30,000 people uh, emigrated in those years. And those left behind, as Stephen has talked about in Point Saint Charles, were very uh, hard hit. Uh, so in 1969, for example, uh, Saint Henri had the highest infant mortality rate in Montreal at 28.3% per 1,000 inhabitants. So I think in Montreal as a whole, it was around 10% uh, in 1969. So through the prism of my local research, then I wanna kind of channel my thoughts into two comments on the broader idea of ruination, one in appreciation of the concept and, and the other more questioning. Um, I think one thing that's particularly useful uh, in the concept of industrial ruination uh, and especially with respect to how it's laid out in Alice's work, is that it's geared towards capturing the long-term nature of deindustrialization. So ruinization is a process, uh, ruination rather, rather than an event, both in terms of shifting patterns of capital accumulation uh, and their consequences for working class lives. So in the context of saint Henri, the kind of widely accepted narrative of deindustrialization, certainly in the popular discourse, but also amongst most labor and urban historians uh, in Quebec, situates the kind of the moment of no return for industrial production with the opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway in 1959 and the subsequent closure uh, of the Lachine Canal. So you can see on the map they're running between the, the neighborhoods, the small blue line, which was essentially the main industrial corridor uh, in Montreal. And it's true that you know, staple industries like steel and textile did move to more lucrative pastures in the 1960s, uh, and they took their breadwinning uh, union jobs with them. But there were a whole other raft of light manufacturers, however, that replaced these industries throughout the 1970s, the 1980s, and even into the 1990s, essentially seeking to exploit the same comparative advantages that had attracted the earlier generation of industry before the historic compromise of labor and capital in the 1940s, which is to say a, a lack of union organizing uh, and in often cases, sub-minimum wage. So the experience then, thinking about Arthur's work of the physically ruinous work um, and the political struggles in bottling plants, toy manufacturers and chemical and plastics production has had a very significant impact on the gendered nature of class in the area, uh, as both the workforce of these tertiary industries and the, also the subsequent neighborhood-based community organizations that grew out of movements to organize those plants were heavily feminized. 
So then the political orientation, I think, of working people in Sanofi uh, in their navigation of ruination has been much more oriented around reproductive and household struggles than in other single industry towns that we can think about in North America. We think about steel towns or coal towns in which we're really thinking about uh, male workers. And so I think thinking about these tertiary industries as occupying uh, a central role in, in the long process of ruination is really important for understanding uh, at least our context here in Quebec and probably more broadly across uh, the Western world. And it's actually the long drawn out nature of ruinization of this kind of largely precarious feminized workforce uh, over a 40 year period really that has had more of an impact on the health and cultural patterns of working life in the neighborhood and working class uh, patterns of living than the closure of the primary industries in the 1960s. So in carrying out interviews, I'm often uh, speaking with folks who have problems with their feet, uh, mostly women, um, mostly who worked in those plants uh, into the 1980s, uh, just from doing assembly work, um, assembly line work. Where I think the concept of ruination is less helpful or, or where I have questions about it is that it relies on a certain visibility of both physical structures and of a deindustrialized yet still fairly cohesive working class population. And these are two things that are increasingly hard to identify the further we get into a North American capitalist economy that's more oriented around speculation and profit than production of value. So in general, and I think this has been the trend, uh, you know, in the kind of reaction against the, the, the runaway plant thesis, deindustrialization studies has a lot to say about class identity and memory and not nearly as much to say about the making and unmaking of classes or class composition. This is something Tim was talking about last month and uh, in terms kind of trying to put a Thompsonian framework uh, on the evolution into understanding the making of a post-industrial class. So we end up missing crucial aspects of the deindustrialization process in our search for the industrial working class and its memories. Um, and so I think we need to think seriously about the unmaking of this class and the process of lumpenization. So Jay Sakai, who's a movement theorist that I really like from Chicago, describes the lumpen proletariat as the hidden class. And he writes, as they are being divorced from a class role in production and distribution, thank you, they are naked of identity and need always to be borrowing their neighbors to cover that up. In the context of my own research, that has looked like people I've interviewed looking to nationalist euro quebecois identities were actually uh, which were actually fairly transparently con constructed by middle-class intelligentsia in the 1960s and 70s. So the problem in, in these interviews, uh, or what we're problematizing in our conversation is not so much capital flight, that in most cases took place up to 40 years ago, but rather immigration into the neighborhood, both of a largely Anglophone gentrifying population, such as myself a long time ago, uh, and of working class immigrants from other countries into the local social housing. And so the neighborhood that was conceived of by its residents in the 70s and 80s as being defined by class and class struggle is then being reoriented around the concept of community and a kind of comforting homogeneity. Uh, so I think we need to pursue the concept of ruination beyond the industrial working class to look at ruina ruinization of the class as a whole and the deep you know, what has emerged as a, a race-oriented lumpen population um, in the aftermath. And I think, you know, just to, to finish off, I know I'm probably running over my one minute, but this is something that we can really think about in terms of, of the American election, right? We, we're, we're talking so much, what about the white working class? What about the white working class? And in fact, I think we're not often really talking about the working class at all. We're talking about a, about a post-working class lumpenized population. Thanks. Thanks, Fred. Really provocative uh, questions that you've raised and really fascinating projects. So thanks for sharing that. Um, uh, so our next speaker is uh, Rebecca Dolge, Curator of Natural Resources and Industrial Technologies from Ingenium. Okay. Over to you, Rebecca. Uh, thanks so much, Alice. Um, so yes, as Alice mentioned, I'm the curator at Ingenium, um, which is Canada's Museums of Science and Innovation. 
Uh, we look after three museums, and those include the Canada Science and Technology Museum, Aviation and Space Museum, and the Agriculture and Food Museum. I should also note that I'm an adjunct professor in the School of Indigenous and Canadian Studies, so I've read a decent amount of Talk as well, and very much look forward to weaving those narratives into how in museums we think about deindustrialization, ruins, and ruination. Um, I just wanted to say, même si je présenterai en anglais, je suis heureuse de répondre aux questions en français aussi. So it is a little bit incongruent that my first slide is an architect's rendering of our brand new Ingenium Center, where we will be able to house most of our collection and from where we will be able to make this collection more accessible. But I think that the incongruency really illustrates my first point, which is ruins, ruination, and to some extent industrial heritage and deindustrialization are all topics that are challenging to represent in museums. And I think that this might be because of three major things. And the first is that physical ruination is often site specific and that the museum is a little bit like a lapidarium of history where fragments are retired. And the second is that social ruin, ruination this speaks a little bit to what the uh, presenters before me, particularly Alice, were saying earlier about the planetary scale of ruins and the effects of colonialism, that this can be difficult to communicate through material culture. It is much easier to document through oral history. And though, of course, oral history methodologies are integral to museum practice today, um, they were not in the early years of our institutions, which is where a lot of our collection you know, was grounded. The third is that ruination is actually halted by the very nature of contemporary conservation, which aims to freeze artifacts in a particular moment in time. So my questions are, how can museums best facilitate ethical and reflexive temporal encounters between past, present, and future in the context of ruins and ruination? So the origin of my thinking about ruins and museums can really be placed in my doctoral project on museums memory in Berlin. Uh, so Berlin's Neues Museum is a museum that was a ruin. It originally opened in 1855 as the embodiment of both Prussian commitment to progress and Hegelian notions of history. The museum was badly damaged during the Second World War and then left as an exposed ruin throughout the time of two Germanys. Then two British architects, David Chipperfield and Julianne Harrop, won the competition to rethink it in 1999 with the plan to freeze the ruins, stop ruination, and recontextualize the fragments in a re-established and reconciled building, reconciled with its past, which is something we can discuss later. Of course, the Neues Museum is a different kind of ruin. It's a war ruin, and it experienced a different process of ruination, and it embodies a different kind of temporality. But interestingly enough, the Neues Museum was a reference point for me when I visited the ruins of an Ontario Power Generation's early 20th century Calabogi generating station that was badly damaged by a tornado uh, in 2018. But again, this is a site that bears the marks of obvious trauma and rapid destruction that are different than processes of slow physical ruination accompanied by social decay. ruination that we're talking about today. So instead, I want to pose a site-specific challenge. Uh, is my internet okay? Or Inco Superstack. At 380 meters or at 1,250 feet, it's the second tallest chimney in the world. The Inco Superstack began fully operating in 1972 and its purpose was to disperse sulfur gas emissions produced during smelting operations at INCO's Copper Cliff site. It was decommissioned in July 2020 and dismantling will commence in the next couple of months and it will obviously take several years. Not only does the Superstack give visual identity to the city and to the region, it is also an object of extreme and sometimes extremely mixed public sentiment. Mining and metallurgy are multi-generational industries in the Sudbury region. INCO, an important Canadian company, was bought by a Brazilian company, Valley, in 2006, amidst a period of decline in Canadian R&D, technological development, and global leadership in the sector. The dismantling of the Superstack might be emblematic of broader changes in the industry, which has led to elements of social ruination and decline in some communities. So how are we in museums, particularly national museums, where we do not have the possibility to work in a site-specific manner, unless it's through collaboration? How do we tell these kinds of stories, the stories of neighborhoods, the stories of communities? 
Sometimes, as, as is the case with the graffiti covered doors from the Gold Core Dome Mine, curators like my predecessor, Anna Adamek, are able to save pieces of heritage which we in the museum can work to interpret. But sometimes acquisitions are insufficient or impossible. So how to really tell stories of ruination and resilience in the case of the Superstack in Canada's National Science and Technology Collection. So this is one case study um, and the other is actually the Athabasca oil sands and the petrochemical industry that I personally would like to explore during the seven years of this grant, both in terms of research and in terms of practice. And for now, I can propose two tentative thoughts on how I might go about this, interested in feedback and definitely interested in collaboration. The first is perhaps the most typical as it comes through facilitating engagement with the fragment to tell the story of large structures. Museums often use photographs, models, drawings, or casts of specific features. But coming from my experience working on the Neues Museum, I've always been drawn to bricks as they are the fractals or the fragments that They're beautifully able to embody an environment. All bricks, especially hand-thrown bricks, have marks of makers and marks of use. For me, bricks are, may be considered an expression of Jane Bennett's vibrant matter, where materials possess a form of quasi-agency. Bricks can produce and affect affect, and it is a perfect example of an object that could be used to embody the history of deindustrialization. But the second method combines artifacts, art, and technologies. I'm so glad we have an artist in residence program in this grant in order to evoke site-specific heritage in a museum while grounding it through encounters with material culture. I'm going to return to Berlin again to show you an example. One of the more famous and obviously controversial because of questions of colonialism pieces in the Berlin State Museum collection is the Pergamon altar. The artifact is currently inaccessible due to construction and instead visitors can access what is called the Pergamon Panorama, an immersive 360 degree panorama produced by artist Yadagar Assisi. Panoramas are primarily a 19th century phenomenon that allowed the world to be brought to a person standing on a platform. Of course, they are not without their problems, but certainly experiments with virtual realities continue to flourish. The challenge in our case as a project team would be how could we make this a shared and multivocal, multi-perspectival project. Though the practice of removing culturally significant in situ heritage has changed a lot, as has sensitivities to community needs and the dangers of predatory museum work or the awareness of the dangers of predatory museum work, I wonder whether there is something, whether there is something to be learned from the hybrid approach taken by the Berlin State Museums to representing large scale heritage um, or ruins. For me, I think that adding oral history to this approach and creating museum installations, exhibitions that facilitate both human and grand scale thinking about industrial ruinations and processes of ruination might be an effective way forward. This approach would ensure that human stories and the stories embedded in bricks or fractals do not get subsumed by grand narratives. And it would also be a reflexive approach for the museum to take that adds interpretive dynamism to the afterlife of objects and stories once they arrive in our care. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Rebecca, for a really interesting presentation. I, I really love the idea of the fragment and, and the tension with, with processes and sites and scale. So really fascinating work. Uh, and it, it ties really nicely to the, the, the final uh, presenter in uh, this round table, Olaf Schmidt-Rutsch, who uh, is offering a perspective from the Industrial Museum of Iron and Steel Works at Hattingen, I believe. Yes, thank you very much. And now a little bit another case of a field study because we as a Westphalian Industrial Museum work actually in one of these yeah, more or less ruins. So it's the Henry Sutter Iron Works just at the banks of the River Ruhr. To give you a short idea of the situation, it's just at the southern edge of the Ruhr area. And this is my maybe one of the specialties because it was the offspring of the raw industry in the 1850s, but then coal mining moved northward. And as an effect, the region in the Ruhr Valley actually was deindustrialized during the 
second half of the 19th century, so at the beginning of the 20th, most of the coal mines were gone. And so the uh, image of a steel town in the Ruhr Valley looks very much like this. So it's a very idyllic thing. And just aside of these medieval city structures, in 1854, there was the founding of the Henry Suit in Hutting. And when I think about this time, I have the idea that a quotation of Thomas Edward Clive Lessie from the 1860s in the war area coming to mind, my mind who said that when moving in the region is like passing from a land in which it seemed to be always afternoon to one in which there was no night. So the situation of no night might be illustrated by this image of Henry City in the 1960s. So founded in 1854, it was a major employer of the city of Hutting, which around 60,000 inhabitants, up to 10,000 people working in the ironworks, which just could exist because it was highly specialized for everything what was not mass production but heavy and large and this holds uh, secured the existence up to the 1980s and just goes as long as the nuclear nuclear industry or space in the space industry nevertheless in 1987 it was decided to close down the blast furnaces and at this site it was obvious that the the iron and steelworks couldn't exist in that case any longer. It was an enormous protest from not only from the workers, but from the whole population, because there seemed to be the fear of yeah, deindustrialization, of ruination. And the protests were successful in a kind that there were several social schemes actually to avoid this. And one of the things was to, to buy the area of the ironworks by the state by public hand and reorganize it. And on the other side, we had the situation that parts of the steelworks and one of the blast furnaces was transported to China. You see this at the same time in 18 and 1989, just two years after closing the blast furnaces, the, the, Westphalian Lippe Regional Authority decided to take over one part of the area, one of the blast furnaces into its Westphalian State Museum for Industrial Heritage. This museum was founded in 1979 very much as a reaction to deindustrialization, and it was the idea of holding typical industrial sites in the region in their social structures. So the workers' houses were important as the modern engine hoisting engine, for instance. And it was very much influenced by the grassroots movement at this time. Nevertheless, only 2% of the original area of the iron and steel works were taken over. And one very interesting point was that the part of the gas engine house, I hope you see my mouse cursor, this part was making for was preserved for every kind of public activities so what happened was that people who say we never will set a foot again on this area and we will never again visit this forbidden city went over for some activities in this part it's funny thing in this in this thing is that this this public room this event room was completed very much earlier in the present in the conservation scheme as the museum part which just was open to uh, some four or five years ago doing this making or uh, doing an open door policy it was able to get the idea of a cold blast furnace furnace in a way hot again so we can't actually reconstruct the atmosphere of working in a steelworks still on an authentic place. So the blast furnace will be cold and it was very important for us to get contact to the former workers who explain their job to us. And what happened in 2000 when we opened the first trail of, of iron was that we combine the heritage site with faces. So we have 
following the process, we always have some faces explaining what happens there. And this gives, uh, gives the whole site a very personal view and a very personal attempt, approach to get the whole mass of some steel construction in a more or less living condition. The other point was that we became very close part of the Yes, the industrialization process and one very bold step of Robert Lauber, who was director from the beginning, was to ask 10 years after closure, several persons who were affected to the closing about their ideas, what happened 10 years before. So this book of his must be 1997, sorry, not 1987. Um, the idea was that to get a letter from the people involved what they say about this process 10 years later. And it's still an interesting reading because it covers the president of Germany, former president of Germany, as well as a leader of the Women's Society for Preserve, for Saving the Jobs. When we did a same, uh, similar project in 2012, our volunteers says that they didn't want to talk about the struggle for jobs again, but maybe a little bit more about the working life and the situation the works was before closing. And nevertheless, you see, seeing this, this catalogs of our exhibitions that the images of the site changes as well. One of the last projects was in 2017, now 30 years after closing, 100 Hüttenleben, 100 Ironworks Lives, which may be the last, the last, last thing of a, of a still fading generation. So for us, the question for the future is where will the museum go on? So will it be a more folkloristic part? Will it be a, an event part? What we can say is that during the last 30 years, we are a place which is nice to be and we are liked by the people and we play a role in this urban com community. So being a little bit a product of the industrialization as well. Nevertheless, I think we have no future as a ruined or lost place. So I fear or think the lost place will be lost because we have not only the responsibility for the people's stories, but also for the site as well. And I fear preservation schemes of the future will destroy many of the rust atmosphere, which is still a vivid thing today. But nevertheless, and let's put it a little bit with a, as a reminiscence to Neil Young, we all know that rust never sleeps, but we have the task to at last being relevant for future social discussions. So it's a little bit more not so general, but maybe an idea of what we did in this situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ola, for a really thought provoking talk on a, a very rich case study and a, and a lovely end uh, with, with that, that quote. It really speaks to the themes of this, this panel. And thanks to all the speakers for your fantastic uh, presentations. And I think there's a lot of synergies and between the themes that we've been talking about. So uh, I'd like to open out the, the panel now to uh, discussion. So questions, if, if you have questions from the, the the participants also if any of the, the speakers have questions for each other then then raise your hand in the uh the the zoom <laughs> thing or else um type your questions into the chat box if you'd rather not uh, speak <laughs> 